Welcome back, everybody, to In The Loop. Hey, this is Evelyn Stetzer from the Smithy Group. Can you believe it's June? Like writing a six on your piece of paper of what date it is, that's wild to me. Well, talking to a lot of our clients and talking with Punchmark, now is a really good time to invest in your website and your team and your processes. So that's why I'm excited to present with Cody today about the digital salesperson. This is part one of a two part series, walking through everything from wish lists to birthdays and anniversaries, everything in between to set your team up for success. We're really excited for you to listen to this. This episode is brought to you by Punchmark, the jewelry industry's leading website provider. Join a community of nearly 500 other jewelry stores in choosing Punchmark's easy to run and e-commerce enabled website platform by visiting punchmark.com for your free trial and demo. This episode is also brought to you by The Smithy Group, a digital growth agency that helps leaders and businesses dream bigger and achieve multi-generational integrity. Through insights and intelligence, digital marketing, and advertising solutions, we help businesses expand their business and grow their revenue. We've helped hundreds of businesses surpass their goals and believe that whatever your business, whatever your story, that you'll make it matter to your audience. And finally, a very special thank you to The Edge for sponsoring this week's episode. You'll hear more about them later in the show. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to In The Loop. We're excited to have you here. My name is Evelyn Stetzer. I'm the integrated strategist at the Smithy Group. And we've got a TSG takeover for today's podcast with an important two-part conversation on the digital salesperson. So integrating your digital services into your clienteling process for the ultimate customer experience. I'm joined today by Cody Giles, our director of integrated strategy. Cody, how you doing? I'm doing well, Evelyn. I'm excited to be here and chatting about the digital salesperson. We have a lot of these conversations with our clients, so it's good to bring it onto the podcast now. Absolutely. I'm excited too. I think it's the first time we've really run it all the way through this entire concept. So both Kitty and I work a lot with our brands and retailers all across the country. And something we always think about is how our marketing fits into their larger process, the larger customer journey. We ask questions about how you know they prospect new leads and surrounding zip codes. We ask about what information is collected at the point of sale. And we ask how they're followed up with at every step of the way. So that's a lot of information to cover, which is why we're splitting this into two episodes. But Cody, from your perspective, why is this important? Yeah, I think, you know, as we approach our marketing, we, we're all about cohesion in terms of messaging and approach. And we're really careful when we think about that customer journey, what that looks like from the very beginning. So it could be somebody that's seeing an ad for the very first time that has no exposure to the brand previously. But OK, now they saw the ad, they've taken an interaction. What does that look like as they go through the funnel? So how are we talking to them? What are we doing at the very top? But then what are you doing in store at the very bottom of that funnel whenever they came in to look at something or to make a purchase? So as we think about the funnel, it's, you know, again, about that cohesiveness and messaging and approach. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. So the key takeaway from this episode is to start asking important questions about your customer journey and make sure at every point and every system trigger that your team has a process to catch that person and nurture that lead even beyond the point of sale. There's nothing worse than asking somebody what happens when this happens and they say, I don't know. So we're here to kind of make sure you think about all of the questions and, and can have a discussion with your team internally and make a better plan. So we're going to break down all those questions to ask yourself as a brand or as a business, starting with when someone's shopping online. So we've categorized all of our questions. We'll go through them all. And again, this is a two-part episode. So let's start with online shopping and go really nuanced. And question number one, Cody, I know you're excited about this, is what happens when someone makes a wish list? <laughs> what happens when someone makes a wish list? I don't know. We hear that <laughs> one quite often, but the wish list. If you have that functionality on your website, truly is a gold mine. And if you haven't utilized that, you could tap into sales almost instantly. Yep. So when you think about it, if someone's making a wish list on your website, they're telling you what pieces they're interested in and they're giving you their information if they have to make an account to create that wish list. And what do you do with that? It just goes in a database and just sits there silently. Right. It's so much untapped potential if you're not leveraging a wish list. And using that in client telling, what needs to happen? If somebody makes a wish list, you need a funnel to reach out to them, passing it to a salesperson or you reaching out personally, start talking to them about the piece that they're interested in and get them in store to buy it. They're literally telling you, hey, I love this piece. I want it. And we're not doing anything for that. I want this. Please contact me. And nobody contacts them about it. (laughs) 
so we've, funny. We've literally seen people put engagement rings on their wish list and the next day our clients are turning like a $10,000 sale yep. for an engagement ring. It's wild. Yeah. Just to come out of the gate with guns blazing, like this is the dollars in your DMs idea that we've been talking about at TSG a lot is like how many thousands of dollars could potentially just be sitting there and they're just one more touch point away from converting, from making that purchase. Or they just need someone to walk them across the line. They have one more question about it, or maybe they left it there and, and want to come back to it later. So my question with Wishlist too is how can they access that later on or be reminded about it? So you mentioned having an account on the website. That's a great way. But I've also seen some other retailers follow up with, hey, I saw you put this on your wish list. Here's a picture of it being worn or here's a video of it because they have that person's text information with that account and have the ability and permission to reach out to them, which is important. We'll talk more about that later. But it's just interesting to me, like seeing that piece style too, usually does so much to get me across the finish line of like, yep, that's going to look good on me. Thank you so much. I appreciate the personal reach out. Kind of puts pressure on people. I actually have a story too, before we go to the next question about Recently, I, I DM'd a jeweler on Instagram that I was interested in one of their pieces. I was basically saying, I was commenting saying, wow, I really like this. And she instantly DM'd me with the information about it and the link to it on her website so I could learn more. And then she kept following up with me. Like two days later, she's like, hey, did you put any thought into this? And I'm like, um, it's not in my budget, but because you're asking me. <laughs> I'm going to make it in my budget. <laughs> I might be convinced that they're going to be my wedding day earrings. It's time to splurge. Uh, it was really convincing. So that's just the power of wish list. Do you agree, Cody? A hundred percent. I like the kind of what you've explained here. You've interacted, you've asked about information. They're passing it along to you and they're following up after. And like you said, it was really cool for you to have pictures to see it more from a lifestyle perspective and not just that sort of white background shot that we always see on the website. So mm -hmm. look, if somebody adds something to their wish list and you follow up with them and say, hey, we saw you were interested in this, this is a great option. Here's a few more pictures of it that we took just for you. Mm -hmm. It feels so personalized and it puts that onus back onto the customer. It's like, oh man, the, the experience is great. I already love the product. What's left at that point? It could be budget, but according to Evelyn, she's gonna make room for that. So <laughs> they're gonna make room for the budget for it if you're just reaching out with like superb customer experience, you know? Yeah, well, it's hard to say no to a person. True. And that's kind of what we're getting at here with a digital sales person. And again, we're, go we're coming out with all, all of our information on the first question here, but we really want to catch people if they're listening to this in the first five minutes, you know, it's about that person and that personal experience. So number two, what happens when someone signs up for your newsletter? Some people also say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> also a good one, you know, whenever we start with our clients, we're going through and doing a website audit is to evaluate everything and where we stand before we start implementing any sort of paid campaigns. We want to make sure the website's in a great place, right? So we're going through the website. We're saying, okay, hey, you've got this newsletter boxes in your footer. Or it's on your homepage or it's a pop-up. Where are these emails going? What are you doing with it? And like, I don't know. They're going into a list and we have access to the list, but we're not doing anything with them. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, these people have said, send me information about your brand. I want to know more. We need to act upon that. So what it should ideally look like is an automated email sequence. So if I'm, and this happens a lot with the really larger e-commerce brands, I'm going to their website, I'm providing my information either because I want to learn more or because I'm going to get a discount. So We've all been on the websites where it says, sign up and receive 10% off your first order. Mm -hmm. I get an immediate email from them, either just welcoming me into the brand or that coupon code that I've requested, that's a transaction. And then ongoingly, every week, every two weeks, et cetera, I'm getting recurring emails, some that are either introducing me to the brand overall. So I may go through my own journey after I sign up for an e to be on the email list where the first email's telling me more about the brand, the second's telling me about a particular product, the third's telling me about their services. Over time, I'm getting more exposure to the brand, understanding that until I go into all the regular email sequences. So think about what you could do with these new email subscribers of yeah. what, what's everything I want to tell somebody about my business that I'm going to tell them if they come into the store, because that's what's so important about my business and what's going to have them convert. How can I put that in a sequence of emails to really convey what our business is and why you should really be purchasing from us instead of a competitor? Absolutely. Two things I love about that. One is that once you set up those email triggers and once they're already in your system, it works for you. Great point. It, rather than like against you and the cost of the time it takes to do that versus the cost of return on that investment of the time that you put in, it's like incomparable. It's, it's amazing <laughs> what happens with that. You set that email sequence up one, you set the email sequence up one time 
and you just put people in it and it automatically rolls them through the entire journey, time after time, and you don't even have to think about what you're doing. It's doing it all for you. Exactly. The second thing I love about that is also when people sign up for your newsletter, those email contact lists, that's seed for your your paid campaign, right, Cody? Like that, you pull all that into what else you're doing. So that's just another trigger in the process that should be thought about. Like if those people sign up for your newsletter, you know, use them in your 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 ad campaigns and as a, an audience for breakouts for the future. Absolutely, you can take that information, upload it to Facebook. You can upload it to Google as well for retargeting campaigns. So get that information and think about all the ways that you can use that as you move forward in your marketing mix. Yep, absolutely. So another question we want people to ask themselves is what happens when someone abandons cart? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> kind of like the wish list, huh? Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, yeah. It's the same situation, right? Of someone's going on your website, you know, they're browsing. I add something to my cart. I start the checkout process. And if I've started that and I put in my name and email address and information, is your system capturing that? In case I abandon checkout, you can then reach out to me after to just remind me, hey, there's still items in your cart. I just got one today from Walmart. It's like the items in your cart are selling fast. It brings that immediacy around it. Like, okay, you need- Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I need to go back. I need to complete that purchase. So do you have some sort of process set up for abandoned carts to make sure you're able to recover people that are interested enough that they've went to your website, they've added something to their cart, and they've started the checkout process because they have to provide some information so you can capture that to be able to even email them. So they're almost at the bottom. They're right there at the edge. So that abandoned cart email can do a lot for you. And even beyond that, you know, what are you doing for customers after they make a purchase? Are your systems set up and are they advanced enough so where you can say, Here's a good example. Somebody's buying an engagement ring and let's say they bought an engagement ring online from you or even from your store. Are you coding them? Are you tracking them to be able to send an email campaign as a follow-up about wedding bands? They're going to be in the market for that later, right? Yep. So what are you doing there? How are you? So it's also thinking about what are they buying now? How do I convert them to buy again in the future? And what does that timeline look like? So even if it's for regular fashion jewelry, if we're talking about the jewelry industry, right? They bought, they made a purchase. Are they going to come back and buy again in six months? Is it going to be a year? What's that typical lifespan of a customer before they come back into the store? How do I prompt them to come back via email? Absolutely. And I think the key nuance here is timing, right? Timing's important. The, even the drip campaign we just talked about, you know, how many days between that? You know, typically we recommend like a week or a week and a half just to stay top of mind, but not bombard them. And similar with that abandoned cart, you know, immediate could be good, but then sometimes like the next day, you know, catching them after they've slept on it, might be better. So just asking yourself, even based on the engagement ring versus the fashion piece, like that abandoned cart sequence could be different based on how how much time they might need or the high intention of the purchase and how how pricey it is. It could be a different experience per person to make sure that it's a good experience for them. Yeah, those are good variables to consider. Absolutely. So now let's talk about like when people just natively get to your site, like everyone's obsessed with the chat function and seeing a person pop up there. But then we also get asked, like, is a pop up annoying the 10% off? So in your view, Cody, what should happen when someone chats with the website or gets the website? Well, one thing you mentioned about pop ups, people ask if it's annoying. We just had a conversation with a retailer about pop ups. And I think if you're going for a pop up, really consider when that comes up. Is it immediate whenever someone hits the website? Because for me, if I'm going to a site and I immediately get served with a pop up, I'm going to click out of that. I don't even know about the brand. I'm not going to give you my information yet. So think about, can you have a situation where you have action based pop up? So they're either on the website for a certain amount of time, maybe 30 seconds or a minute, or they've scrolled so far through a page or they've clicked on another page. Think about how you can tie actions into when the pop up appears. That way it's not the immediate thing someone sees once they hit the site and they're going to click out of it from there. Let them interact with your brand and get accustomed to your brand for just a bit. Then show them the pop up. I think you're going to see more conversions coming back from that. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the chat element, look, Evelyn and I are probably the same in a lot of our generations. I do not want to call anybody on the phone. <laughs> if I can chat with somebody and text with them, it's so much better. Mm-hmm. It is so much better. So the chat feature is such a good opportunity. Evelyn, are you going to say something? Yeah, thanks for letting me jump in. So I actually saw this recently where someone's message in that bottom corner was, there's a real person behind this. <laughs> I was like, I love this directness. There's a real person behind this. There's a real phone number. You can actually text us and we'll answer you. And just cutting through that noise that we, there are so many websites with chat functions and they're all on different spectrums of, you know, is this outsourced internationally for automatic replies? Or like, is there a real person behind this in the store that we can talk to? So I think brands can even get ahead of that concern by being so real and by saying something that direct. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, and then there's a variety of different CRM platforms out there that would allow you to put, you know, the chat features on the site. We've talked about a few of them on the podcast, um, but it's a great opportunity to just have that one-to-one connection for people like myself, my generation, I'm a millennial. I know it's also for Gen Z, they're coming up. We've talked about them on the podcast significantly, right? We want that quick communication, but we don't want it via a phone call. We want it via texting. That's our preferred message or messaging overall in general. And it really all goes back to with that chat functionality, it's the idea of that always on salesperson, which we Ben's talked about before, we've talked about before, and the idea that yep. with automated responses even, you know, it's a consistent experience people are getting every time to start. And it's not, you know, the worry of getting a salesperson at the wrong day at the wrong time when they just had a bad day and yep. they're not in the mood to talk with somebody, right? So if you even start off some of your chats with automated replies, yep. it, it provides that same cohesiveness that we talked about. Everyone's getting the same experience to start. And of course, as the conversation goes on and gets more detailed, it really has to flex out from there. But that that digital always on salesperson, like it can really work in your favor. It's a 24 Mm seven addition to your team. Absolutely. Because when we talk about chatting with the website and, you know, people chatting maybe at all hours of the night, I just want to be clear, people don't exactly expect a real person to immediately reply. So how can we use automated reply saying like, hey, thank you so much for reaching out. We've received this request and we'll get back to you. Even that's powerful to have a good experience because I think the fear with chatting or this this immediacy of contacting the brand, it's like, well, we don't pay people <laughs> to work at midnight on Saturday. So what, what should we do? So setting up those automated replies is a really great solution that still gives a good experience. Love that thought, Cody. Yeah. All right, so we've talked a lot about the website and all the integrations you can do there. So let's pause for a quick break to hear a word from our sponsors. Support for this week's episode comes from The Edge. The Edge is the jewelry industry's leading point of sale system, though you've probably already heard about how amazing they are. They're in the business to help independent jewelers succeed in an ever-evolving retail environment where technology plays a major role. Their promise to their clients is to never let them get caught in technological or functional time warp. The Edge develops their software on state-of-the-art technology and adds features and functionality in the best interest of their users. In the words of Edge founder Dick Abbott, our biggest reward is the success of our store owners. To learn more about the Edge Point of Sale system and all the ways that can accelerate your business approach into an omni-channel solution, visit theedgeforjewelers.com. Thanks. Back to the show. Okay, we're back. Thank you, Cody, for this awesome conversation so far, talking about the online environment, talking about websites. Now let's move to in-store. I know that there are a lot of things that we've seen retailers do and brands do to have a really good experience. And we kind of want to talk about them and give some ideas to people of how they can integrate digital in person. So my favorite thing to talk about with our retailers when they first come on board with us is, so what happens at the point of sale? We actually asked this in our onboarding call. So we can just learn their process, how much data they've already collected and make some very quick and easy improvements. So Cody, go ahead, talk through a few of those. Yeah, absolutely. One of the biggest things that we talk about really, we're so focused on email marketing and even text message marketing that we spend a lot of time talking about what's happening at the point of sale. So what does that look like if I'm a customer and I'm checking out with you? You know, What information are you capturing? For me, the big piece here, and Evelyn kind of teased this mm-hmm. in the first part of the conversation was, okay, you've got somebody's email, you've got somebody's phone number, but have they consented to receive marketing updates from you? Because oftentimes a retailer will say, oh, I've exported my list. Here's all my customers. Like, cool. How have they came into this funnel? Do you have proper permission to reach out to them? So it's something to really consider. You know, for, I know for a lot of people that we've talked to, they haven't really thought about that. They just kind of mass uploaded everything into the systems, but really think through, you know, do I have permission to email these people? Mm-hmm. Text messaging can be very stringent on that as well. If you're doing mass text, which I think we may talk about soon, but as you're thinking through those elements, really making sure you have that proper permission there and that you're not just using the information in a way that they haven't provided consent for, or you don't have that permission that, you know, you're looking for even beyond that too. It's about, you know, what else are you talking about whenever they're going through the checkout process? Are you having them you know, follow you online? Or even the big one is, how did you hear about us? Like, what, how are you capturing that information? Yeah. Because we've talked to retailers and so we have a campaign that's running well. We're talking to the retailer about the performance that we saw online, trying to understand how that's impacting the in-store traffic. So what we'll say is, you know, 
Are you asking people how they've heard about you? Have they saw you because of social ads? Did they hear you on the radio? Did they hear about you from a friend? A lot of times they're not capturing that information, so they truly don't know. So it's a really easy question to ask as you're going through the checkout process, you're talking with the customer, oh, hey, how'd you hear about us? If you have your system set up, you can put that in the systems and you can actually start tracking over time. You know, in November, we had more people hear about us on social, on Instagram, in December, it all came from Google. Like you're able to track that and that helps inform all the marketing decisions that are being made. And it also allows you to say, if they, you know, they found you because they heard about you from a friend Mm -hmm. that you can say, okay, Hey, go follow us on social, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram. Right. It's a way for you to plug in your, your social platforms during that checkout process. It also provides different talking points as well to keep them engaged while you're going through this process of checking out. Right. Yeah. We've seen it done a few ways. So we've seen people integrate it part of the touchpad, you know, when they're checking out where you can just give that check mark of, yep, you can contact me and here's my phone number and here's my email. Like, do you want this receipt texted? Do you want it emailed or both? You know, that that's part of that process. And I think we've come to expect that too. So for the retailer listening to this, that's afraid to ask for the email contact, you know, we're, we're pretty used to it. Most people I would say are. True. And so just being forthright about, Hey, we capture email so that we can best support our customers and give them information when we have it readily available. We would love to contact you if that's okay with you. So just saying that up front and saying like, we're not going to annoy you. We're not going to send you an email every day. Uh, We would just love to stay in contact with you for your future purchases. Just saying that. Uh, So you can have it in the touchpad or you can just vocalize it and, and begin to build that relationship with people as I'm sure a lot of people are already expecting it. And another thing I've seen that I really like what you're saying, Cody, is integrating that social edge, right? So, you know, if you heard about us on social, maybe there's a special discount. I know my sister, when she went to a dentist and when she contacted them and they asked, how did you hear about us? She said, I actually found you on Instagram and Instagram is a huge part of their marketing. They gave them a discount. She gave them like a 10% off. Oh, you, today you get the Instagram 10 discount. Wow. And it's like rewarding people for hearing about them. For discovery. In their different channels. And that that's such an easy win to make someone feel like really special. I just thought that was interesting because if someone comes up to you and checks out and says, oh, I actually found you guys on, on Facebook today or I saw your ad. Like you could say, oh, you're going to get the ads 15 discount. I mean, it doesn't have to be for everything, but it's just an idea yep. to, to nurture the relationship and keep them following you on social. Like I would feel reinforced to stick with the brand and stick with them on social if that behavior was rewarded at my point of sale. Call your dentist, ask about social media discounts. It could be there for you. I, I, I agree with that 100%. That, that it's, again, it's being rewarded for discovery, right? Mm-hmm. And it's incentive for them to ask so they start, because they're asking so they can really know what's working best for them. So it's a win-win. Yeah, even the angle that my sister called me and told me, and I was like, oh, I'm going to call them now and <laughs> tell them about them. Exactly. The, That's what they're hoping is going to happen. The word of mouth, because it's different. And I hope someone hearing this is like, oh, that's different. I got it. I'm going to be different than everybody in my town. And that's how referrals spread like wildfire. I love it. Word of mouth advertising for the dentist. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> word of mouth dentist. Ha ha. Uh-huh, Good yes. pun. Let's Thank go. you. <laughs> All right. Next question. So. Integrating the website in store, um, we have some retailers who are like, well, how can we have the website up? Should we have it up on the TV? What should we do? Um, I'm going to talk through having an iPad in store. I know it might be another purchase on people's minds. However, I just see it working really well for a few of our retailers. And Cody, you can talk about this too. But I see it working really well when a salesperson is walking something through with someone and they check out together on the website or show them more information on the website or break down information in a different way on a landing page. And it just reinforces maybe they've already seen that with ads and then someone's talking it through with them. It's like, oh, they know what's going on. Mm -hmm. They know what's on their website. They know their ad experience. They know their journey and they're doing it in person. And I love that because it gives the, the salespeople almost a power and a confidence to navigate the site and catch inconsistencies. You know, if they see like a product that someone wants to buy in store and then it's not online yet, you know, they can analyze that process. And it also just helps the salesperson keep that consumer journey top of mind. Cause even if, if they're having problems navigating the site with a customer, you know, that's worth looking into and worth checking out and making sure that the site is always optimized for searching for discovery and for checkout. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really the approach that Tesla takes. So if you are looking to buy a Tesla and you go to a, a service center, I can't really call them dealerships, but you go to a location 
and you talk to a sales rep about buying a Tesla, they sit down with you at a computer or an iPad and you just walk through the website and you go through the process that way. Uh, but like Evelyn mentioned, it's good for the salespeople to be able to go through there and also spot those incongruencies from the side or be able to understand, mm-hmm. hey, this wasn't the best actually action plan of how we developed this. Let's rethink that. What I want to hit on is what Evelyn's talking about is whenever you're with somebody and you're going through that process together, but what happens before that? So we've had situations where you know our retailers are saying, we have too many people in the store. We don't have enough sales teams to be able to help them. So we have a lot of people standing around for a bit waiting for somebody to assist them. You know, they're Bradley browse the jewelry, they've looked around, but now it's like awkward. They're just looking around waiting for somebody to help them. So how do you bring in tech to help with that? What I think you can do, and let's take an example as, let's say I'm coming in to buy an engagement ring. I walk in, everybody's busy with somebody else. I look around at the engagement rings a bit, but I'm mostly just standing around waiting for somebody. Well, online, I know we have a landing page that talks about the bridal experience. It talks about it step by step of what the process looks like. I know that's what a sales team member is going to talk to me about, but why can we not go ahead and introduce somebody to that bridal experience and what to expect while they're waiting for somebody to help them? So really easy to do if your team is full. Hey, here's an iPad. Take a look at our bridal experience. We're going to be with you in just a bit. They can start kind of reviewing that on their own. Or there's a QR code that's on your display that says, Mm -hmm. you know, scan this code to learn more about our bridal experience. That gets them like consuming information while they're waiting for somebody to help them. So they're not standing around. Time feels like it's going by slower than what it actually is. And then they all of a sudden just leave because they get tired of waiting because they feel like it's taken five minutes, even though it's been just a couple minutes. So it's just having them do something while they're in the store waiting for somebody. Yep. As we talk about what's happening, how do you leverage your website? How do you get an iPad in store, et cetera? Those are things you can think about. Absolutely. I think this is the perfect dichotomy of the digital salesperson, meaning two things, right? It's the digital salesperson, meaning the salesperson is equipped with digital to reinforce their, mm. their work, but then also the digital salesperson as in like a, a bot, sure. like a, a digital salesperson working for you when you're not working. I love that. I think that's the nuance here. That's a good way to explain it. And that just came to me just now. And I, I just think it's, it's fun. Good. It's like a, a two way of seeing this entire conversation. And you can see that it's like a dance between the two using, you still need people, but also you need digital and how those two things work together can be different per situation. So let's sum up this episode with one last question. What happens when someone says something in store that they like, kind of like putting it on a wish list or that hint or tells you, you know, I'm looking for my mom's birthday. It's coming up next week, the personal details. That's a good question to ask uh, in store because people drop a lot of hints. And I know it's kind of weird to be copiously taking notes on your phone, but like, what can you do as a team to keep track of that information and do something with it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we have a lot of retailers that try to think about this. If, you know, it's somebody coming in store, let's say it's a woman coming in store and she's looking at pieces and she's not made a decision. Like, well, let's add some stuff to your wish list. So they're adding to the wish list and they, as they're getting the information for that customer, they're saying, you know, do you want us to add anybody else? Can we drop a hint for you Mm -hmm. so we can add your partner's information into our system as well? Oh, when's your anniversary? When's your birthday? These are all like subtle questions that you can ask that you can really use to your advantage down the road, whenever we talk about clienteling when someone's birthday or anniversary is coming up, which Evelyn is actually in the next episode, right? It is, and there's too much to say about it, and we're almost out of time here. So what a good teaser for the next episode, which is why this is two parts. So stick with us and keep learning about easy ways to win as digital salesperson in the next episode. Thanks, Cody. Thanks. Hey, thanks for listening. Leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts and remember to subscribe. It really helps us grow. Thank you so much. See you next week.